What is the secret to unlocking your full potential? What makes your idols any different than you? How do you become the person you've always wanted to be in life? This is where you get all of your questions answered. My name is Justin Shank, and I sit down with some of the most epic individuals who are changing the world with their actions in business and in life. We discuss how they did it, why they pushed themselves, and more importantly, how they were able to focus on continuous growth to achieve their dreams. Welcome to the Growth Now Movement. This week, I sit down with Justin Cavanaugh. This week is the long-awaited return of Justin to the podcast, and you guys know that he's become a dear friend of mine over the last three and a half, four years, Uh, and he's really somebody who I hold near and dear to my heart. And in this episode, we dive into how as an entrepreneur and leader and coach, you're able to see things before they happen so you can pivot first and stay one step ahead of everything that's happening. Now, if you guys attended Growth on Movement Live last year, you saw Justin speaking, you know how his mind works, how strong he is on the entrepreneurial side and coaching side. I think you guys are really going to love this conversation. Now, before we get there, make sure you grab a ticket to Growth Now Movement Live. Head over to gnmlive.com. Get your ticket today. Obviously, an incredible speaker lineup. Plus, you get to come hang out with Coach Cav because he will be there in attendance as well. So you'll be able to catch him in the halls and build a relationship with him there. Now, without further ado, let's get to the episode with Justin Cavanaugh. Cav, long time coming, man. Welcome back to the show. Good to be back. I thought we had already done this already. Then you realize we've never recorded these talks, but we talk all the time. <laughs> we talk often. And, and the funny thing is you literally just said right before I hit record, you're like, is this my second or third time on? Because we have these type, like essentially what people are going to listen into is like the conversations we have on a regular basis. Because honestly, when you surround yourself with the right people, like the conversations are the conversations you need to grow. It's the conversations you need to improve your life. And I'd say all the time, whenever I talk to you, I have a new idea, a new direction, a new understanding of where I need to be, you know, in my business or in the space of, of whatever. But dude, what's, I want to talk about kind of the time that we're in right now with like coronavirus and everything that's happening with that and like how it's affecting the world. Even, I mean, now we're, we're what day 73, my girlfriend keeps track on Instagram stories. So we're like day 73, a lockdown, you know, business is not being open. And obviously you're somebody who owns a gym along with all the other stuff, which we can get into. Um, but like, what's, what's your take on this whole entire situation? It's crazy. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't kept count. I mean, I think I could be like, you know, um, I feel like I can be put like, just like marks on the wall with like a rock and start <laughs> to like keep track of things. I'm sure some people feel that way. Um, I, I will say, so I had the week before everything kind of came out, um, I sat down with Tanya for lunch and we were, you know, we had a real serious conversation about like where we think a few things are, you know, not only in the world, but also like where we are with regarding, um, you know, the, the gym and, and, and everything. And I, I'll be honest with you. I think I was the first gym in the country closed, you know, we closed, you know, without any one mandating uh, closures. Um, we adjusted our model really quickly. Um, you know, the, before even there was no news that things came out, we shifted from large group to a very small one-to-one, three-to-one, you know, structure, which is normally dealing with hundreds of people in large group environments because we, we deal with athletes. And we made that, we made that adjustment early. And I, I think a lot of that had to do with like, you know, Tanya really just sitting down and having a, a real hard to heart around like, you know, what, what's the best thing for the business? What's the best thing for the, the uh, for the families? Like how do, how do we do this the right way? And again, this wasn't a panic mode. People weren't in this panic mode. This was just a matter of like, Hey, I think we need to be a little bit ahead of uh, some of these concerns. And I got a lot of backlash. I'll be honest with you that that weekend before things came out, before Trump gets online and, and, and tells the world what's going on, I got a lot of heap saying this was, you know, you're being ridiculous. And like, I don't understand. What do you know that we don't know? And and the answer is nothing. The answer is, you know, we're still going to do like our job as as a company is to, is to make people's lives better. Like athletes dreams that, you know, are, 
are our priority. And it's like, our, we can't do anything if someone's hurt or someone's not healthy. You know, if our job is to make someone healthier and a better performance, if we get someone sick, like God forbid, right? So, you know, we made these calls before anyone knew what was really going on. And, and I think a lot of people thought I was nuts. And, um, you know, being in business as long as we've had, I think that was a bit of a shock for a lot of people. Yeah, what was, what was the thought process behind just shutting down versus what a lot of people do of like pushing back, saying like, this isn't a reality like, was it because you were kind of deciding before to pivot or what was like? Well, I mean, this does kind of like, so we've been, we've been adjusting our model for a little bit more than a half a year. We were planning on doing some major adjustments to the brand as well as to the model. But I think when you think about it, um, you know, we really don't know like what our values are until they're tested. And for me, like our value is health and, you know, the athlete or the client's best interest always, even if it's beyond ours. And I think when we put that first, we, we really start to know like where people stand. And I think what happens is when people start to, when people start to say, Hey, you know, well, you know, we're, we're renegades or we're like going against it or like water life. There was a lot of like facilities that were just like, you know, we're going to like work through this and your immune system is going to overpower. Like it is not about that. It's not about your belief system. It's not about how healthy you are. It's about the fact that there's people that are going to be affected about, about, about uh, on this subject that, that we can't control. And if we're a part of that problem, then that's an issue. So we, we've chosen to pivot in a position of power versus a lot of people and they they say the word pivot with this positioning that well now they're in a place of weakness right yeah you know it's like their their backs up against the wall at that point they have to and there's not very many people that make good decisions with their backs up against the ropes right like at the end of the day like your job is to pivot and get out of those positions and put put those things back in that and if you don't have control of this environment which we don't we don't have control of you know the 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 nation's decisions or a, a global pandemic what we have to do is you know we got to be in the ahead of it. And if you always put the other person's, uh, if you put your values first, what you'll end up finding is that uh, they could, te- they could, they could, they could last this, the test of time. And the key is, is does our model shift, you know, in the market? Does it, does it, sh- can it shift? Can it still survive in a booming environment or a bust environment? Right. So like right now yeah. we're in a, we're in a pressure cooker, so to speak. And, and does the model, does the model have the ability to swing on this pendulum? to an environment to where we can still serve people. Cause if it doesn't, then I think the model's broken. Right. So that's one of the reasons why, but I think it really just came down to like, where's our value stand? Like what's like at the end of the day, like what's our prior primary function? Like what's our, what's our goal? And our goal is to, to empower, you know, lives and athletes and through sport. And if we're doing that, it's going to be very hard to do that if we get someone hurt. Yeah. I love the take on like looking at, okay, what are our priorities and how do we control the controllable, right? So like that was kind of my stance from the very beginning and kind of the take on my whole entire life is that there's a lot of things out of your control. Uh, and, you know, the government shutting things down, that's out of your control. Well, what can you control to pivot to maintain your sanity, your life, your finances, your family, et cetera? So like that was really kind of what you did. You said, what can I control right now and, and keep this kind of positive momentum that you've been building for quite some time? Um, so what are you doing now in this time? Okay. Obviously you're not functioning in the manner that you were. How have you pivoted? Yeah, well, we still coach people. I mean, at the end of the day, like we're a service that people, we are a service that is essential to the the goals that people have in their life. Right. So at the end of the day, we're working with athletes, at least elite level sport, people want to accomplish something, you know, we're, you know, right now we're in, you know, you know, we're in, you know, you know, pre-comp phase as we transition into uh, Tokyo with some of our guys. We were in the middle of NFL combine season when we were working for draft prep for everybody. So we're in peaking season for that group. We're in, you know, we're in pre-competition for for our Olympic guys and and neither of those things happened. So there's a lot of like get people's mentalities out of the gutter and say, Hey, listen, I know this sucks, but everybody's in this with you. That doesn't make it easier. Right. Because you have a very like individual goal, but at the end of the day, you know, like it is what it is. We have to move forward. So moving forward, what do we do? And, you know, resetting a little bit, you know, it was tough. We had to take a little bit of time, you know, guys that were, you know, transitioning to their, what what is supposed to be their potential last Olympics to some people being potentially their first Olympics. Cause we have guys that are tr- training in different ages right. and um, you know, the, the mature ones, it's interesting. The ones that are kind of like on their last leg, they're actually in a better mindset than the ones that are younger because they had a lot of like anxiety leading up to it. And, and even though you think it gives them more time, it actually just puts the date out of, of stress 
So, you know, once we've kind of reeled that back in and said, hey, listen, that now's our ch- chance to like build the foundation again, why other people work, like don't work, you could separate yourself a little bit. Um, but, you know, even circling back, Justin, like one of the things that I think is interesting is I took this very seriously because um, the, the way I viewed it was this, like wh- whatever your political beliefs are, that doesn't matter. Whatever your, your beliefs are on the health side of things, that doesn't matter either. What mattered to me was the fact that whether we like it or not, the, the name COVID, the name, you know, the coronavirus, this, this pandemic is going to be attached to somebody's family or somebody really, really close to them passing away. Yeah. And when that happens, like it's not real until it affects you because you just, you gain a different level of perspective. And I, the reason why I took this very serious, like there, there was never a, uh, a COVID workout that we put out. Like we didn't put out one. And I, and I told, matter of fact, I sent a, a number of messages to my staff and I said, guys, if you do this, and these are some from, from other people that I, um, that I have really close relationships with, they're at a high level too. And, and they put out like COVID workout of the day. And I, and I was very adamant, like, if you do this, you will no longer work for me. Like straight up. Like I was not joking around. And the reason why is because that workout of the day is going to be attached to an emotion from somebody that we happen to know that is affected by this in a way that is, 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 is unfortunate in so many ways. And within a matter of, you know, weeks, you know, we had, you know, a very close client, um, husband pass away and we had a, and within, you know, two weeks into it, we had a coach that was in our building on the pro side of things, you know, multiple years ago that used to help mentor some of our professional athletes pass away. And, um, you know, just last week we had an, an athlete's, you know, um, family member elderly pass away. You know, you imagine having the COVID workout of the day pop up on your, on your Instagram feed every single day from a, a and a, a company and, and a, and a person that you admire and you look up to in the sense that like, that's their, that's where you're safe. You don't feel safe anymore. So I think people need to kind of get their priorities in order and they're using this as a, as a way to kind of have some level of humor to a really, you know, tough situation. Uh, but we're, we're, we're looking, we're looking right down the barrel of a, a of a, a really, uh, a really tough economy. We're looking, we're, we're, we're looking, you know, dead shot into a, uh, an environment that is going to change the way that we operate forever. Right. People forget really quickly once we go back into things, but there is a, there's, there's a sense of like, um, overarching view of this. Everybody knows about it now. It's not like, well, it affects some people, like it's going to affect everybody because even if it's not a direct effect of the health, it's going to be an effect of their lifestyle. And when it affects their, affects their lifestyle, people start to like take notice. So I think that, you know, the way we come back to this is we have to do things different. So the way I'm looking at it, and I think this is something that would be very important to the audience is why would we go back to what's normal? Like, I don't want to be like, if anybody knows me, I'm not average. I'm not above average. I know where I stand. I have, a, I have an ego and pride to say that, Hey, I am part of the 1% that I, I posted this up not too long ago. And I said, elite athletes don't do it better. Mm-hmm. They do it different because what I do is very different than, than just what other people do. And I, I think when right. you understand that, it's like, there's a lot of people that do what you do and they do it better. They do it worse. But like what I do is like, I, no one does what I do. Like what I, it might be in the same realm that we may be talking about the same level, but you know, I, I know that in elite sport, very, very few people do what I do and, and I separate myself. So why would I want to come back to a new normal? Because I'm not normal. So why don't I come back and become the new standard is the way I look at it. So we're going to come out of this and like, there's an opportunity to come back out of this and be above average. We're going to come back out of this and pivot in a position of power. We're going to come out of this and, and we're going to make these adjustments as a company and as an organization, as a, as a family too. We'll make these adjustments. But why, why, why make these adjustments to be better than everybody else? Why don't you make these adjustments to where everybody's chasing you now and you are the new standard because you got to reset in regards to the, the, uh, the industry popularity now. Because now it's an even playing field. Yeah, everything. Yeah, everything's reset to zero. You know, in a sense, and, and that's pretty much any any business, right? So obviously, anybody listening to this from a business standpoint, we're all going to be opened up, and we're all starting at zero. Um, or hey, look, you better be making the moves now to make sure you're starting at much further along than zero, um, because those gates are going to open, and everybody's going to be running. And what's that going to look like? And how do you stand out? And how do you set that? Like you're saying, set that standard for you know, this next round of living or however you want to word it, right? Like I look at like when people say, I want things to go back to normal. I think of like those dudes back in high school who peaked 
and they're now 45, 50 years old and they still talk about high school. Like the, you have to continue to create that next level for yourself, you know, and, and the reality is so many people aren't doing that. They're not setting themselves up. Like you said, they had, they waited for their back to be up against the ropes for them to even pivot or, or make that next move. So you talk a lot about, it's funny when, when, you know, people get to see you speaking to your athletes and then hearing you on this podcast, like people hear empathy on here, right? Like I'm not going to allow somebody to put out, I'm going to work out, you know, the COVID workout of the day because it could trigger something emotionally for somebody. But when you're coaching people, you're tough, man. Like I watch it, I'm like, damn, but that's what works for you and your athletes, right? So how do you balance that? How do you balance that empathy that you truly have um, and the fact that you can get pretty tough with some of your athletes? I mean, I think that's a, it's a good point uh, to look at, you know, in any, any area of our lives. But for me, it's really when someone comes to me and says, I want to be part of this elite group of, of athletes um, that everyone else has said that is impossible, but they internally believe that they could do it. Um, well, there's a reason why they're coming to me because I'm not the easiest person to work with. You know, I, I happen to have a really good track record. Like no one could argue with our resume. No one could argue with the people that come through the door and the success that we have. Like there ain't no doubt about that. But people are coming because they understand that stuff in their past hasn't worked for them. So, you know, I am going to challenge them. I don't think that what they were doing, it, it is attached to what they know. And I get it. They're doing something that is attached to what they know. And, and that familiarity, you know, makes them step out a little bit outside. The easiest ones for me to work on are the ones that I get that, that have no background in training or no background in, in, as far as experience. And they're saying, hey, you know, they just, they show up on the doorstep and this is where they kind of are born into. They don't realize how good they have it until they leave. And they go, oh my God, I didn't realize how bad it is everywhere else. They just had no idea. Right. Um, the ones that, that have been broken by the process, they come back and they go, Oh my goodness, this is so different. And there's a lot of resistance there. I think people, they want to be challenged. I think people are, um, they're better when they're, they're challenged. I, uh, I'm, I'm very well known for making people really uncomfortable quickly. As you know, uh, I, I, I like to do this. It's, it's part of a, it, it's, it's happened, definitely, fun it's for happened me. to me multiple times. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fun for me to like, you know, point these out because you know, my, my belief is that, in a, in a state of adversity, people are the most honest, right? Yeah. And why not get there faster? Why wait six weeks of a relationship? Why wait two and a half years of just doing like, you know, you know, short tidbits for people? Why not go deep right away and find out if you're a good fit? And then just be like, hey, it's a love or hate relationship. Bye, not for me. And then you can now, you now know, know where to put that relationship. Um, and I'm very like I'm very blunt with that. I think the brutal honesty creates a level of transparency and a level of like speed that you can't get. So why not do that first? Why why wait? Why wait and be like so disappointed that these people that are online are fake? Why wait? Yeah, you wasted your time. Six months of investment investing into their 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 personality and their life and their business to realize like oh my god this person really only wanted this from me. So I'm just very transparent with my intention. Like my intention is very upfront. Like, this is what I want from you. This is not what I want from you. Um, I don't, I, you know, even in like when I was younger, like there was no dating scene for me. It was like, you know, I have great relationships, friendships. And then there was like a very specific interest that I had. And that was it. Like I never like dabbled into relationships. It was like, right. I'm going to see if this works. We're going to go deep into this uh, component. And that's, for me, that's, that's kind of how I operate. I really believe that like, if I meet you, I want to make you as uncomfortable as possible, as quick as possible to find out who you really are and find out if we can move forward, you know? And when somebody, um, isn't prepared to handle that, there's gotta be a reason why. And, right. you know, I'm not saying I, I'm, you know, I'm batting at, you know, hundred percent. I'm, 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 I'm definitely not. And those relationships are, are there take a lot more work to then fix, but I'd rather be upfront with that apology or be upfront with the, the mistake, but why wait around? I, I think that's interesting with people. They, in the, in the, uh, God, this is so easy because the podcasting space, you, people are listening to us right now. And for those of you, you know, again, like, I'm just going to direct this to you guys listening. Like, you hear me, you have no idea what I look like unless you've seen some pictures of me before or you've met me in person, but you meet somebody in person and you're normally really disappointed. Like the majority of situations you hear somebody like that guy, that guy gets it. I, I understand what he's saying. And then I meet somebody in person and they're just like, they're, they're disappointing. Yeah. Why? So why be that? Why not just 
be disappointing right up the front and be like, oh, this doesn't work for me. And then you move on. Like I need somebody that is this way. So when you do that, you could, you could show up with this level of like challenge, but you have to also like be respectful to the fact that not everybody is in the same place as you. I mean, yeah. you know, I met you and you're in a very different place than you were, you know, a number of years ago, but you're still, you're still the same person. You're just grown. You know, and I, I, so the core of who you are now, you might have shown up differently. Um, I joke around, but, you know, Tanya met me, you know, you know, 10 years ago and I was in fantastic shape. You know, I had a full set of hair. I was in great shape and I met her. She was just going into the workforce and now, she, you know, so she wasn't anything promising, so to speak. And now she's an incredible, you know, uh, you know, manager at a high level in her company and she's growing and she's done fantastic in a lot of ways now has three degrees and I have. I look very different, right? So I look at things and go, oh, well, you, you, you got to pick better. That's your fault. I did a good job. You did a bad job. <laughs> you know, you know, which is funny because she does analytics and forecasting. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, as a, she does like intelligence stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, like, well, I'm obviously smarter at this than you because I did, I had better picking, right? I, I, you know, if you were a stock, I win, right? Yeah. Dude, no. it, it's <laughs> it's so funny you saying that. But when I when it, when you talk, go back to before we were you're joking about what you look like now. Because actually, I was saying you slimmed down during quarantine. You look good. I mean, the hair hasn't grown back, but that's just the reality you have to accept. Um, but you know, when I look at what you do, and and kind of when I step back and I watch, because I'm an observer in in a sense similar to you. Like I watch a little bit deeper than most people watch, and I understand certain movements and approaches. You know, me asking like, oh, why are you a dick and an empath? I already know the answer. Like, I already know the answer because I've observed, um, you know, on a deeper level. But, you know, watching you do what you do, it's an understanding of like you fast forwarding this process to forecast who should I have in my life? Who should I spend my time with? Because how, how often are people going through, whether it be relationships or business partnerships, where they're forecasting and not in a fast pace and they're like, oh, okay, six months later, you're like, I've just wasted six months of my life, right? And you're breaking all this down. So how do, how can people do that? Because you're somebody who can fast forward so many tracks. You learn you learn so many avenues of business, which is why you get hired to you know to be um, uh, you know a consultant to different companies and so on and so forth. But like, how can somebody do that as quickly as you do? Like, you learn things and you move on quickly. Like, how can people do that? So I think it like it expands and then contracts. So for, I'll give you a really practical example for everybody that's listening. To this like every one of you have a desire inside of you to become um, a, a high level at something. Nobody wants to be average. At least the people that resonate with me, like the people that are just okay with their day to day, like that. You already know right now you're not going to you know get along with me, right? That doesn't mean I'm not going to hang with you. But I like to be around people. I like to be like. Have you guys ever listened to bad music? Now I'm not talking like genres. I'm not talking about like different types of music like country and, 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 and Spanish music and hip hop and, and, um, and classical. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, have you ever listened to your favorite type of music, but done poorly? That's mm -hmm. what we see when we look at the scales of experts and, and people that like where the root of stuff comes from. When you find where the, the root of something is, and you realize that's where it's so elegant. It's, it's displayed beautifully. When you go to an orchestra and it's like, gorgeously represented to you and it sounds amazing it's artwork right, right. but there's a, there's a rhythm to it that is so consistent and that that rhythm happens from thousands and thousands of years of practice and that's the level of the specialist so what i mean by it, it expands and contracts when you're when you're younger it's this curiosity right so you become basically this generalist where you have this curiosity in different subject lines and then you find the one thing that you want to become good at and you go deep. Like I've, I've never been a teacher, like in the sense of actual a school teacher and the majority of people in my profession have a degree and then they go into coaching right in that world. I've only coached. So I've never had anything derail my development right. from what I want to be good at by, by trying to catch two rabbits at the same time. Yeah. You, you, you go home empty handed. So because of that, I've had, I've taken my curiosity but I found the thing that I'm really, really passionate about and I went deep with it. And because I went deep with it, what, what, what made it very unique is I go, I go seven layers deep. And the fact that now I'm at this position where it's like I've seen the root of these problems that I found with people and performance, I could now sidestep. I could, I could step to the side at a deeper level. I don't have to start back from ground zero because I fast track what it means to go deep. You can never unsee the things that I've seen. You can never right. unsee the, the things that I've been around. Because once you see that stuff, you like, oh, you can't get it out of your head. It's like a bad, it's like a bad nightmare, right? It's like once you see that 
this person is very superficial, but to everybody else, they're the, they're the greatness guru. What ends up happening is within two seconds, within two seconds, you're around this person and you're like, bam, you already know. Even if that's not the area of the expertise that you're in, but because you know the depth, of of expert or level that you could go with with another area you automatically could see it in other components so what happens is, is there's two things people lack the curiosity early on and then se- the second level to that is they're not interested enough in going deep enough because they're scared of the gap sometimes what happens is once you see something and it's scary they say oh we got to close that back up and then i then they go follow a trend center then they go follow the fads and the reason why is because they realize that's unattainable and they don't want to put the work in to go deep enough to be at that level. And what yeah. they're like, well, it's actually easier to be part of the superficial crowd because in the superficial crowd, those people, they have this level of perceived expertise, but it's not that hard to get there because it's manifested through an artificial strategy. Right. So then they take that and they go, hey, I could, I could become that. Because I don't need to be as, as deep as that other person. I don't need to be as solid as that other person. And with that, what ends up happening is you have a lot of people follow those other people. And that then becomes a, uh, a, almost a trend in itself. And I would rather fast track that by going into a deeper environment so that when you say, hey, I'm willing to kind of not be known for these things, you then could actually be the person that the people that are known for go to. Yeah. And there's a, you know, it's, it's really like the thought process of like that ninth, the 19 year old life coach who lives at home and he's teaching you how to live your life because he decided to latch on to a quote unquote guru who bought the course just happened to be five years earlier. Right. And so it becomes this trend of these false, lack of a better term, false prophets who are spitting from this ivory tower that's literally made of plastic. Right. Like they don't even understand what they're, what they're saying. Right. And so, so often we easily buy into that, but I love your thought process. Like for me, I always thought it was smoke and mirrors. You know, when we like, we know who we're talking about specifically without saying their names. Um, you know, for me, I was like, I get so Let me do it with everybody. So like, don't take this in a sense of like it, talking about one particular person, because I see this like every single day when I introduce myself to people and when people introduce themselves to me, um, you know, um, I, I think that, Ari Mizell, somebody who I look up to and that does a fantastic job of just being very genuine of who he is. Like he's a, he's a, it's a very unique situation where um, he lives and dies his brand so well that like he actually, when you meet him, he's more impressive in person, right? Um, yeah. Than when you just see him, experience him online. Like I think his, 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 his other presences, whether it be podcasting or like online stuff, isn't as good as who he is in person. And he he always told me he goes, you know, there's 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 a there's a fine line between being um, the secret weapon of a company or behind somebody, or like you're helping that person grow, and the dirty little secret where nobody wants to share you, right? So yeah. it's like, you know, that's probably not a good place to be. Like you should be known for what you do, um, and it's okay that you share that you are at this level um, versus having that other person that's trying to hide potentially the thing that's building them. Right. So you never want to be that person's dirty little secret. You always want to be that person's secret weapon because they want to have pride in it, even though they don't want to share you with other people. Uh, There's a difference between having pride in something that you know is powerful versus having this kind of like this, you know, in your, in, in your soul, like you feel bad that you're doing this, but you're still getting a result that's better than if you did it the right way. Yeah. That will come back to bite you in the ass. No, for sure. So I want to talk, I want to pivot really quick and talk about, cause my back's up against the rope. So now I'm pivoting. Uh, but I want to, I want to talk about coaching right now because you're somebody who, look, I, I know who a lot of your clients are when you think about the NFL guys like Trey, um, what's his last name? He just did the, the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Evans brothers. Yeah. So, you know, you look at that and you go, okay, well, this guy went through so many obstacles and got hurt so many times and you were able to get out of him the things that got him to the NFL, right? Like, look, all signs pointed to you're not making it because he got injured pretty much every single year in college. And so you're able to kind of get the best out of him. Now, obviously, you're starting with somebody who has potentially the right mindset, but how can a coach... In, in anything because you do business coaching too for n- a number of business owners and, and uh, other organizations. But you know, how can a coach get the most out of their clients 
um, while guiding them in the in the the right path? Like, what are some tactics people can take to really build that strong coach client relationship? So you know, coaching is it's an art, right? Like, I, I truly believe that. Like, I think at the end of the time, at the end of the day, you have to. To, in order to know art, you have to look at the greatest, you know, painters and, and artists. And and when you look at like Picasso or Dali, and, and like, I, I I reference this story often um, with people that resonate with art. Um, but even if you think about music, like think about the areas that you think are are such at a high level, things that are masterpieces, right? Dali looked up to Picasso. I mean, that was who he wanted his mentor to be for forever. And what was very unique is. Early on in his development, he um, Salvador Dali would, would master pointillism and different strokes and different types of art. Like he got to the point where he had mastered imagery, and when he mastered the the individual um, type or area of of painting or, or drawing or whatever, or just understanding shapes, then he moved on to the next one. Right, but if he got, let's say, he got stuck in pointillism and it just didn't it didn't connect to the the greatest artist of, of pointillism, he would, he would basically stay there, right. Until he mastered it. And then what ended up happening, he then, you know, mastered that and then moved on to the next one. And the, the art aspect is how do you blend and put all of those things together to make something that is your own. Right. Yeah. And that is be, that's what becomes the actual masterpiece. That's what becomes the artwork. And that's how you create and evolve into something that's so different than everyone else is doing. It still has the foundations of what people know, it's just different because it's it's at a every little component is at a mastery level, and um, he he strived very hard to build this relationship with uh, Picasso. You know when he was coming up, and it's finally you know his wife at the time was the one who um, really you know made that relationship connect. But I thought what was interesting is they had a good mentorship mentee relationship until the day that Dali sent Picasso a portrait that he made of him, the way he sees him, the way that the, the, the mentee saw the mentor. Yeah. And from that day forward, Picasso never talked to Dali ever again. Wow. So what's interesting about that is why is because the, the image in which the student saw the teacher was not in the likings of the way the teacher wanted to be seen. Mm. But it's interesting because. But he got the results not only did he get the results, it was a sense of like honor to be able to, to draw and, and to paint this picture of his mentor. And he, right. he viewed it as the, the greatest um, portrait ever to his mentor. But the actual mentor, Picasso, was, was embarrassed by it. He was like, that's not the way I want to be perceived. But in reality, that is what got through to Dali. Mm. So sometimes the people you're the closest to you right? See you differently. But if it means the most to you, right? If, if those people mean the most to you, don't you think that that's important to actually hear? Yeah. So what ends up happening is we go as a, as a, as a community, as somebody who wants to learn and, and then develop and work with other people, we go to the people that are actually very superficial to get like the sense of like internal fulfillment. When in reality, we should go to the people that we have the closest relationship with us that are going to tell us the things that aren't the best, that, that, that shine the things that we might think are the ugliest of who we are, but are the things that actually made them feel good and made them stronger in their long term. Mm. That's the stuff that I think is so unique because that's the stuff that actually makes them you know, masters. And that's the thing that makes them experts. That's the thing is that, that they're okay with being genuine in who they are so that the people that are the closest to them, the people that know the true like ugliness of who they are could actually make that something that's actually attractive. Now I want to know how your clients would paint you. Oh, it just depends on what client, <laughs> right? Like I and, and I have to be okay with that. Like I know that that person probably doesn't like me. I know that this person doesn't like this part of me, but then at the end of the day, like I need to make sure that they know that I did it in their best interest. It's a, right. at that point it, it crosses the line, right? There's, there's a difference between. So Athletes are like glass. Like I, I think that they're tough, but I, I think that they're like glass where you could push on glass. You could stack a whole bunch of books on glass. You could put a whole bunch of dinner plates on glass, you know, as a table, you could stand on glass, you could jump on glass and it still doesn't break. But if you just take a diamond, right. And you bring it across it, it's going to scratch it right away. And if you just drop, you know, 
a hammer on it once, it's going to shatter. Right. So you could stack thousands and thousands of pounds of pressure onto this and nothing will happen. But if you do something in the wrong level of leverage and you do it with the wrong intention, and that's what I mean, right? If you change the intention, if you, if it, if the intention goes from, I'm trying to harness what you have inside you to an intention of, I'm trying to harm you, you've lost that relationship forever because you broke glass and you can't fix broken glass. Mm. So when you're a coach and you're working with an athlete, no matter the discipline, right? If you're a teacher and you're working with a student, understand that everything that you're doing is you're working with glass. Um, and you have to be respectful of that relationship because the minute you cross that line, it's over. And you could push somebody beyond what they're capable of, but if you break them, and now I'm not talking about like breaking a horse in, I'm talking about breaking the horse where you can't do it, you know, where they can't do their job anymore. You've now lost them forever. Yeah. So I know that you get athletes that walk through the door that have this dream of becoming professionals, right? Just like a business coach might have somebody come to them and say, you know, they dream of being an influencer, being a top podcaster, or video person, or being somebody on screen. You know, they just don't, there's something not there that, they, that you know that they're not going to make it, right? So you know these guys, no matter what they do, no matter how hard they work, they, they're probably the hardest workers that come into your gym, but you know they're not making it to the NFL. How do you treat them? How do you kind of nurture that relationship? Do you tell them straight up like, hey, look, you're not going to make it to the NFL and you continue to give them that? Like, how do you nurture that relationship as their coach? It's a good point. Uh, it's a good point to bring up because I don't set limits on my athletes. Like, why? Like, who am I? I'm going to say, hey, listen, I don't think you can make it, you know, then I'm not going to work with you. But if I'm not the one paying them, then who am I to make that decision? Right. So I have to look at it and go, okay, realistically, the way that you show up right now, there's no way you're going to make it. This is what you have to be like. Like, this is the things that you have to overcome in order to do that. Do you have the capability? Do you have the belief system that that's going to happen? If you don't change your behavior, if you don't change things drastically, not 10%, 20%, 50%, thousands of percents every single day, and you show up totally different, then there's a chance. Because um, even, even if you showed up a totally different athlete, with what you're currently working with, you don't have a shot. So you, you're going to have to do something just so out of the park, you know, different than everything else to be able to make right. it. What does that look like? And then you go from there. I, I don't want to set a limit on an athlete. Who am I to tell an athlete that they can or can't do something if I'm not the deciding factor? If I'm the deciding factor, I'll be the first one to tell them like, hey, man, like right now, not for, not for me. And I've been wrong, right? I've been wrong. But um, why am I putting a limit on an athlete? If an athlete has a goal, then – we have to just start to make sure that we align their ambition, their actions with their ambition. And if their ambition is so far out of sight, out of mind um, with their actions, then, then they know internally that they haven't done everything they could to achieve the goal. But when you know, when you laid it all on the line and you know that you did your best, that is the actual reward. The reward is not necessarily the, the outcome. A journey is different than the, like, than the actual process. The process of getting you from point A to B is there. The journey is, is ever changing. You don't know where the destination is. You don't know what that path is going to be like. You don't know what the hurdles are going to be on that path. And you have to be very respectful that, that it's not going to necessarily go in your timeline. So an athlete comes to me and says, Hey, I want to do this. I say, okay, cool. I don't think you can go find somebody else. If I genuinely feel that way, then I probably sh should relieve myself of that duty because I shouldn't be taking money from an athlete or spending time with an athlete because I'm just going to inject my insecurities into them. Yep. But if I genuinely believe someone could do it, then I have to like say, okay, well, in order to get there, it's going to be tough. Let's see if we can put it together. Even in the business side of things, like in my group of business, I have a ton of people that reach out to me that want to join, you know, you know, with, they want to work with me in some way, shape or form. And I just say no it's really easy for me to say no, because I could just say, I guide them to a new resource. Yeah. Um, and say, this might be what's better for you. And hopefully they, they see it and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they turn into something that's good. Um, you know, I've been wrong in, in, in a lot of areas in my, my career. I just have to be true to who I am because if I spent time with that person, I wouldn't feel good about that relationship. Number one. And then number two, if I spend time with that person, 
Um, and I didn't think they could make it. I'm holding them back. I wouldn't be able to pour everything into them. Yeah. No, I love that, man. So I don't know if I asked you this question last time you were on. So I want to ask you, um, what is your, what's your definition of success? Uh, and what are three daily habits you have uh, to make, to get you closer to that definition? I think you did ask me this and I think it's interesting because I don't ever remember what I do in these podcasts, but I think, you know, my definition of success is, um, so actually I'll, I'll spin it differently, right? Because I do think I answer this. People ask me like, what, what, what do I want my legacy to be? Right. And I'll, I'll answer it this way. Cause I think this is a, it's a deeper question when it comes to success. The legacy I want to live is a leg- legacy of when I'm gone, that you treat my son in a way that honors what I offered you Mm. because if he comes up to you and he's in a certain way, if he, in some way, shape or form, he, my son interacts with you when I'm gone and you know that I treated you a certain way and you're like, Hey, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do right by this, um, this individual who's in front of me who did X, Y, or Z towards me. Um, that is going to be like the ultimate fulfillment, which I won't even be able to be there to, 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 to have or, or to see. My goal is to be able to make sure that I, I, I interacted with people in such a way where they, they understand the intention. So they, they treat him in a way that, that doesn't need the credit, right? Because that, that, that's to me the ultimate form of success is that I don't need the credit, but I need to know that the outcome is going to be there. You know? And if I'm, if I'm rough on somebody, if I'm tough on somebody, but they know it's for a good reason, they're going to be tough on, on, on my son. They're going to be there, but they're going to do it with a level of attention. That's not to harm, but also to, but to enhance. So the daily habits that, that are doing that is number one. Um, so I have, I have five things that I have to do every day that, that I don't do every day. And, and this is full transparency with everybody that's listening is like, if you that's hear this, I love like, you. <laughs> like if, if someone gives you this, this fucking morning routine, I want to, I, you know, the, the best thing that you should, I told you like the best podcast that you should do, Justin, is there's two podcasts. The, the number one is like when you interview like experts or, or gurus on their morning routines and their lifestyle and their woo-woo stuff, like interview their significant others right afterwards, right? Yeah. And then if you interview somebody on success and how great they are, interview their mom right afterwards, right? Right after I get off this podcast, my mom's going to be the mom's going to listen to it. She's going to be like bullshit. She's my mother. My mother's going to call bullshit. And that's the thing that's so unique is that that's the relationship that I have with people. But on that note, there's five things that I do every day that I, I, I realize like if I get away from them over time, it starts to, to really become uh, a hindrance to my own development. And that is um, I need to, I need to read, write, Eat because I forget to do that. Got as big as I am, you would, you would think. Um, pray and move because uh, I sometimes don't do that. Sometimes I'm sitting in this chair for whew, it's nowadays, you know, way more hours than my body could actually handle. And right. you, you could imagine that I rested too hard that I hurt myself. <laughs> you know, like I, you know, like God forbid that you don't move, and that's what that's what hinders you, and that's what hurts you. Have you ever sat down too long and your back hurts? Well, maybe that maybe what you need to do is move, right? Um, people need a higher power in their life, right? You know, I'm not getting into, you know, religion. I have a strong belief that, um, um, that, that there is something more than us that's created us and that's guided us. And that, that has allowed me to feel good about like, that's allowed to take away a lot of anxiety. I don't have a lot of anxiety in my life. And I think people that struggle with anxiety struggle with, uh, you know, prayer. The easiest thing that I find with people that struggle with anxiety or, or depression is, is, is learning to pray. Um, and, and again, this is taking religion out of it, but, but I've seen that to be true. Like, just like when you say people that are the most depressed, the, the best study that has re- resulted better, better than any medication is staring in the mirror and smiling for 20 minutes. That is shown to be a, a greater narcotic than any prescription drug for somebody. But there's a, there's a difference between this kind of like narcotic addictive feeling of, wow, that's awesome. And this, oh, that's amazing. That's a deeper way of looking at it. Right. Right. I've um, spent some time right now with a guy named Simon Bowen, um, who's looking at what I do in, in models and frameworks and, and, and his ability to have a level of, um, to, to get something 
to be so expressive without using words is is brilliant in my opinion and and the difference between wow and uh is is a gap that we all seek to find because the the wow is the addiction but that that uh that just relaxation that breathing is the sense of fulfillment is like there it's that aha moment that we're always looking for and when right. someone could express that without any words it's it's impressive and um you know, I, I encourage people to look into those that level of work because it will it will almost explain to you where you're missing, what that gap oh, is. Dude, I love I love that take one. And obviously, you you know that I wrap up every single interview with the same question, and I'm not going to wrap this interview up with that question because you already an- have answered it. So, what I want from you is, what is one tip or one thing somebody can do to grow into the person that they want to be? What can they do right now to grow into the person they want to be? Find the people that represent part of those things that they want to be, right? Find out if it's really what that is versus what you just feel immediately. What's the, uh, the, the, the emotion? That, sh- that first emotion might be the kind of hit. The second or third or fourth emotion might become like once it's all down, might be the real, right? So once you find that out, seek those people out and and try to follow and guide that path, but create your own, right? Don't, don't necessarily do exactly what they did. The goal is to create, the goal of mentorship is to be able to ask and, and, and be guided, right? Not to be spoon fed. Right. So the goal of mentorship is to be able to say, okay, I want to stand on the shoulder of giants, the Tony Robbins saying, right? Um, you talk about, you want to set the table, you want to be in the room with them. Like, there's a difference between being in the room with them. And this is, this is not a knock on, on your, your, your concepts because it, it, it's different contexts, which I think is important. But it's how do I enhance the experiences of what I've learned by being around those other people? And that to me is the difference. So mm-hmm. once you learn that, do something with it. Don't just do up to the point of which your mentor has given you. Take it and make it better. That doesn't mean you, that doesn't mean that you make it your own. You make it your own by making it better, not by changing the foundations, but by making it part of you because he or that other person got to where they are. Don't try to be that other person. Try to be yourself, but be in the best version of it. Yeah. Dude, I love that, man. Cav, thank you so much, dude, for obviously coming back on and, and chatting. By the way, I've asked him many times. He was too cool. Uh, no, but just kidding. But, but I'm excited to have you back, man. I've, I've loved this conversation as always. <laughs> and for all you guys listening, we've had this conversation 800 times. Justin just didn't hit record because he probably, he probably sucks at like the whole like podcasting. Thing. <laughs> just not good at that whole, like recording aspect. Dude, I, I, I just figured out what the record button was. Dude, <laughs> thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Always brother. Love you, man. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the Growth Now movement. This is how you can really help me out. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that fun stuff. And let's grow this movement to epic heights. And it's all going to be because of you guys. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next week.